Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to give it a few more seconds here. We're, <coughs> excuse me, we're a little at seven o'clock. So uh, we're going to start up the Facebook Live and uh, keep admitting uh, folks um, from the Zoom world. So um, while we're doing that, I uh, have a few um, thoughts to, a uh, few, few things to talk about here. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thanks again. Uh, if you have any questions for us um, or emails or comments in regards to our programs, uh, please, you can email those to programs at albemarlehistory.org. Uh, if you have any questions that we can address during the show, uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end of Professor Jordan's talk. So you can add those into Facebook Live or the chat function uh, through Zoom. Um, a few announcements uh, before we get started. May 30th marks the centennial anniversary of the local library system. Um, Charlottesville Public Library um, started in May 30th, 1921. They opened their doors, now known as the Jefferson Madison Regional Library. Uh, we've been very busy over the last few months working with different partners and colleagues and friends to number of programs to mark this lifetime. Um, you can look at our previous discussion with uh, Library Director David Plunkett and uh, filmmaker Lorenzo Dickerson uh, on Facebook video or on our YouTube page. Um, and you can keep an e eye out for an email newsletter coming out next week. Also an exhibit that we will be installing in the Central Library next month and uh, discussing further discussions about the library's journey from the era of Jim Crow to the digital age. Uh, so stay posted through the summer uh, with these various programs celebrating the 100 year anniversary. Uh, for our seventh unregulated historical meanderings edition, it will be on Thursday, June 3rd at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be speaking with students from uh, the Batten School, the Change Group Consulting. Um, we had a number of students, uh, three students this semester working with us. Uh, to plan a major push to get the Charlottesville Albemarle community to contribute and utilize civilpedia.org, uh, our crowdsourced online Wikipedia uh, encyclopedia dedicated to all things Charlottesville and Albemarle County. So we'll be having a conversation with those three uh, very bright go-getting students that worked with us this past semester and uh, hope you can join us. Um, our next Ask a Genealysis program is scheduled for June 8th um, when our own Miranda Burnett and Dr. Shelley Murphy will discuss the Slavery in America database. Um, you can register for that uh, program on JMRL's webpage <laughs> under upcoming programs. And for our next speaker series, we have tentatively scheduled something for June 15th with Sam Towler. Uh, he'll be joining us again uh, to discuss the history of Foxfield Farm, uh, the current home of the Foxfield races. Uh, Sam will share his extensive knowledge of owners of Foxfield from the Monacan Indians to the present, uh, the former enslaved African-Americans on the farm, tell us about the farm when it was an airport, um, and also discuss the history of the uh, Hunt Country store uh, just next door to the Foxfield Farm area. Uh, Sam grew up near Foxfield at Shelford Farm. Um, he's now retired and on our board of directors. And we are also hoping that we will be joined by the new executive director of Foxfield Racing, Kelsey Cox, to talk about their new mission and their direction for that organization. And Please mark your calendars also for a very special program that we will be having on June 29th at 6 p.m. Uh, we will be joined by Chris Semter, uh, curator at Poe Museum. Uh, his presentation will be called The Independence of Poe, Declaration of a Different Sort. And that will explore the idea that just as Thomas Jefferson declared the nation's political, religious, and architectural independence from England, a young Edgar Allan Poe um, who was at Jefferson's funeral while he was here at UVA. Uh, Poe declared America's literary and artistic independence. So Chris will be talking about uh, Poe's time in Albemarle County 
and how that inspired him to break American literature free from European models and values. So please join us there for a special um, program that we're going to be working with on the with the Poe Museum for that. And I want to remind you all that even though it is not required, we encourage everyone uh, in attendance to become uh, members of your local historical society. Um, we hope with this Zoom program that we're reaching out to Charlottesville and Arbor Arborboro County members, and you can definitely join us. Um, but even though, think about your own local uh, historical society too, if you're outside of our region. Um, all the pro proceeds from membership produce, um, help produce these speaker series and all of our online programs. Everything we do as your historical society is because of your support. So please consider doing so. Now, um, you can visit our website also for that, and or you can call us 434-296-1492. Uh, so I think that is enough for our announcements. Um, are we good with Facebook, Sterling, and, and everything else going on in the Zoom world? It looks like everyone's been- Very good. Um, so again, welcome all. Thank you for joining us. And I wanna welcome our speaker. Uh, I'm Tom Chapman, the Executive Director with uh, Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society. We have Sterling Howe here manning the internet connections. He's our programs and volunteer coordinator. And we'd like to welcome um, to our Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society speaker series, uh, guest speaker, Professor Irvin L. Jordan, Jr. The title of his talk tonight is Crimson and Black, a documentary sampler of historic Jefferson School 1860s to the 2000s. Professor Jordan is an associate professor and research archivist at UVA, specializing in Civil War and African American history. He is the author of three books and has contributed to a variety of academic and general publications. Uh, professor Jordan serves on various state boards and commissions and has done so for six consecutive Virginia governors. Several of his lectures and presentations are available on C-SPAN and YouTube. And today, Professor, jo Professor Jordan, um, who is also a, a board member for the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society, a long standing member of that uh, organization, our organization. Uh, tonight, he will be discussing a selection of published and unpublished materials from the holdings of UV UVA's Albert Shirley Small Special Collections uh, Library on the history of Charlottesville's all black Jefferson School. So Professor Jordan, thank you for joining us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Professor Jordan at the University of Virginia. And this evening I will be sharing with you some select uh, slides from materials in the holdings of the uh, UVA Alvin Shirley Spall Special Collections Library. There'll be a few non-UVA images as well. Uh, UVA Special Collection holds about 20 published and unpublished collections on the Jefferson Schools. I need to say here at this point that uh, my purpose tonight is not to project myself as an expert on the Jefferson School, because I am not. I've lived in Charlottesville most of my life, but I uh, am not a, not a graduate of Jefferson School, and I'm assuming that there are members of the audience who have a lot more knowledge about the history of the Jefferson School or who are alumni of the Jefferson School uh, that could uh, be, was certainly more knowledgeable than I am. So, uh, doing a question and answer period, if you ask, if, if I get a question about the Jefferson School and I don't know the answer to that question, I'm going to be uh, an honest historian and say I don't know. <clears throat> so, having said that, let's proceed to our, uh, our next, our first slide. Uh, it's pretty much self explained. I'm trying not to read everything that I've written, but the main thing is when you when something has become accepted as a historical object, a few things might, a few things happen to it. One is gets more, it receives more mention in the history books. The other thing is, is that it becomes the subject of, a, of a commemorative plaques and things of that nature. Now, Jefferson School has achieved that. There, there, there are a great many other African-American and I dare say American uh, persons or places that have not received uh, commemoration of any kind. But Jefferson School has. It has a handsome marker uh, near its nearest building, and it is the subject of a Civilpedia entry, and it is also a member of the, uh, it's also a, an entry in Wikipedia as well.
The education of Blacks in Charlottesville really begins after the Civil War. Um, there are several freedoms that African Americans, the ex slaves, and the free Blacks expected to finally be able to exercise. And these are pretty much self explanatory. They wanted to have voting rights, they wanted to be able to move about freely. They wanted wage employment. They wanted the right to own land. They wanted their families reunited. They wanted equal access to public space. And also they wanted education and freedom of worship because they had seen prior to the, the, the end of the war that uh, the importance of education to, to whites and, and African-Americans certainly were un, under the impression that gaining a solid education would be the key to their future prosperity, not just as individuals, but to them as a, as a race. One of the earliest examples of this was a committee of colored people, which was uh, their meeting was covered in the Charlottesville Chronicle in May of 1867. This is a enlarged clipped, uh, enlarged crop image in which they insisted on common schools open to all without distinction of race, color or previous conditions supported by general taxes. Now, why were they asking for this? Because there weren't any black public schools in Charlottesville and of course there had not been any in Charlottesville prior to the Civil War because the state of Virginia, like most Southern slave states, forbade Blacks from, being, from learning to read and write. There were secret schools to educate Black children in various urban areas like Norfolk or underground schools, but there weren't any as far as I know in Charlottesville. So as I said earlier, African-Americans had seen how important education was and how it could lead to a successful lives. And so this was their public declaration as a group of individuals as to uh, that one of their basic needs was to have uh, education, public school education, and they wanted it to be the uh, integrated education. They weren't asking for schools just for black people. They wanted public schools to be open to uh, for all. And of course, this lady is someone I think many of us have come to recognize. This is, of course, Isabella Gibbons, uh, Charlottesville's first black school teacher. Uh, she was a former UVA faculty slave. And her claim to fame is, is just that, her being a public school teacher in Charlottesville. Uh, for those of you who live in the Charlottesville area, you may have had the opportunity to see the new Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, which opened at UVA earlier this year. Her eyes, from the image of this photograph, her eyes are carved into that, into that sculpture, looking, uh, looking north, sort of looking towards where uh, um, uh, Bodo's is. And it's hard to see uh, unless the sunlight is just right. But anyway, this is, um, she was a remarkable lady in a, in a, in a, in a variety of ways because she was born into slavery. She was a, a slave cook. Her husband, William, was a butler to another university slave. And uh, they became self-educated. He later became a pastor at Zion Baptist Church, but the rest of the Gibbons family remained in Charlottesville uh, during his tenure as the Baptist minister. Also displayed here is the floor pan of the Jefferson School in 1869. And I've highlighted in yellow, uh, Mrs. Gibbons' uh, sitting room. Now, Mrs. Gibbons and her family were still living in Charlottesville. So I'm assuming that this sitting room was for her use during the workday, during her when she was actually working as a school teacher, because she and her family had their own home. So this image is from a collection that is held by UVA, whereas the photograph of her is from Boston Public Library. The white woman who was led education efforts in Charlottesville uh, uh, from, from New England, uh, Anna Garber, um, published this poem for the dedication of the new schoolhouse. It's three pages, and I've only got, I'm only showing three, three, um, three, one page here for you to look at. And this is from a, her book called Harvest Gleanings in Prose and Verse. And we do have a copy of this. Uh, and the Special Collections Library. The volume is in very fragile condition, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. 
It may come as a surprise to many of you local, local members of this audience that Jefferson School's activities were reported on outside of Charlottesville. Other areas were, were greatly interested in the goings on in Charlottesville. And this is a newspaper article uh, on the uh, Jefferson Greatest School closing ceremonies and a celebration of what, what was known as the celebration of the third anniversary of the Jefferson School alumni. And it noted that this was held at Mount Zion Baptist Church. This particular article was published in the Richmond Planet. And we do have issues of the Richmond uh, Planet held by Special Collection. It is also available on microfilm uh, in uh, what used to be called Alderman Library. You will notice that some of the attendees are uh, probably well known to some of you, very local, famous local African-American activists, particularly Benjamin Tonsler, for whom Tonsler Park is named after, George P. Inge, who owned a, a very successful uh, store in Charlottesville as well. Charlottesville's African-American community has always had a strong and proud educational tradition. On the left is Miss Marie Gordon, who's posing with her high school diploma from Jefferson Greatest School. This photograph was taken on June 4th, 1915. According to future Jefferson School teacher, Rebecca McGinnis, the eighth grade at the Jefferson Greatest School was considered a high school grade. So that's why she, the diploma indicates that she's graduating from high school. I've tried to do some research on uh, Miss Gordon and in the uh, census record, didn't find her exactly. I found a, a young lady by the name of Mary Gordon, who was apparently uh, residing with her father in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the, according to the 1910 census with, with five other uh, siblings. The photograph on the right is a 1920 image of the Jefferson Greatest School. I believe that is face, that is facing Commerce Street, which was a main uh, artery for businesses and, and, and places and uh, institutions such as the Jefferson School um, when it was uh, in the area known as Vinegar Hill. One of the things you learn when you take a course on how to do a uh, PowerPoint presentation is you don't want to display items that your audience won't be able to read. Uh, and you won't be able to read this document, I'm sure, but I wanted to include this because this is a petition from members of, of, of Black Charlottesville residents petitioning for a, for a high school, Black high school in Charlottesville. This is, we believe this is around 1921. The petitions included uh, the signatures, it's three pages of, of, of signature. It included the signatures of John West and members of an organization called the Home Beautiful Club. So as I said, it's, it's going to be hard to read, but this is held by Special Collections and it is part of papers pertaining to Jefferson High School. And this was a petition to the superintendent and members of the Charlottesville uh, School Board requesting the establishment of a high school for colored youth. Jefferson High School opened in 1926 with grades eight through nine. Grades 10 through 12 were later added during 1927, 1930. 24 students comprised Jefferson High's uh, graduating class, uh, first graduating class in 1930. Uh, Jefferson Greatest School alumni and teacher Rebecca McGinnis later recalled as having grades one through eight during her enrollment and Jefferson High having grades six through seven when it opened in 1926. According to a 1929 study of Charlottesville African-American, Jefferson School's 1928 enrollment consisted of 147 students, seven teachers, and an 817 volume library. This, um, one of the sources for these images, the Negro in Charlottesville and Avermore County, this was part of something known as the Phelps Stokes Funds publication. And this was a bequest of money from a white woman in New York City in, in the early part of the 20th century uh, to for, uh, fund that she provided funding to various white institutions to quote study the Negro. 
under the direction of either the Department of Sociology, Economics, Education, or History. And so at the University of Virginia, this resulted in uh, approximately 20 some volumes published by these Phelps Stoke fellows between 1915 and 1920. Most of these volumes disparage Black. They focus on things like Blacks being prone to criminal behavior or not willing to work and that sort of thing. So they're racist for the most part, but they do have nuggets of information, uh, even despite their, their scientific racism and anti-Black attitudes. As late as 1962, the Felt Stokes Fund required its fellows to study the Negroes, but Black students and faculty were, were not permitted to apply at UVA during most of the lifetime of this, of this, uh, this grant. You know, so the photograph at the top is Charlottesville High School on the outside. Uh, you can barely vaguely see on the right-hand side, there's a female pedestrian and further down the street, there's a car. Uh, what is particularly impressive is the second illustration which shows the inside of this eight, 817 volume uh, library. Here's another uh, tidbit of information from uh, the one of these Felk Stokes publications. As I said, there's nuggets of, of useful information in these despite their racist nature. Uh, this is from a study called Charlottesville, a study of Negro life and personality. It's published in 1933. You would notice that it provides a description of the two black schools, the Jefferson High School and the Jefferson Gray School. What is of particular interest is that this description uh, says that uh, it actually praises the, um, the staff. It says that the, in each school, the principal is also a teacher. Um, all the teachers have advanced teacher training uh, or working towards advanced degrees. Uh, all of the teachers belong to various local clubs and they live in good homes, read widely and dress well. So again, this is how some of these nuggets of information can be found, positive information can be found uh, in the course of these, these, these studies, which are basically, um, for the most part, anti-Black. Uh, this is a listing of the Charlottesville, uh, color, what was also known as the Charlottesville Colored High School Building's 25 faculty. Uh, this includes the high school faculty, the grammar grade, and the elementary. The grammar grade is, is equivalent to what we would, what we, what we would call uh, middle school. Uh, faculty assignments and residential addresses are, are listed. Um, and when similar lists were compiled by the uh, Charlottesville Public Schools, the white faculty and staff of the white schools were always preceded in the records. The Jefferson School faculty always were, were their, their reports about them were always filed last in the record books. And you may, some of the members of this always may recognize uh, some of the names um, in, in, on this list. Under, in the grammar school grade, there's uh, Mrs. Nanny Cox Jackson. And uh, I believe further down where the Jefferson Elementary School, there's Miss Gertrude Inge, of the member of the Inge family. And of course, Miss Rebecca, Mrs. Rebecca McGinnis, whom I will talk more about later. and later being now. Two of uh, the area's most, probably most famous Jefferson schools, two of the area's most famous black educators, Miss Rebecca Fullis McGinnis uh, and Florence Coleman Bryant. Uh, Miss McGinnis lived to be 107 years old. Uh, she, was, she lived long enough to see this biography of her uh, being done. Miss um, McGinnis, claimed that she graduated from Jefferson Grader School at age 16. This would have been around 1908. There's a Jefferson School class photograph in, uh, in, a, in another book, uh, which supposedly depicts her. Miss, Mrs. Bryant, uh, who, whose fascinating memoirs, by the way, if you get a chance to read them, um, it's something you can read in probably less than a day. Miss Bryant was the, Mrs. Bryant was the first, Af was the first Charlottesville black woman to graduate from the University of Virginia. She, has, she says in a memoir, quote, often I was not only the only black student in class, 
but the only woman and the oldest student, unquote. She graduated in 1958 with a master's degree in speech and drama. The subject, the subject of her master's thesis was the speeches of General Douglas MacArthur, of all people. Here we have something of interest from a, a student at the Jefferson School. This is the uh, from the papers of Virginia L. McGinnis, who was the adopted daughter of uh, L. Jackson Elementary School teacher Rebecca McGinnis. And this shows a uh, class autographs booklet. Uh, it also um, shows the uh, uh, school yell, which was hold him Jefferson, hold him Jefferson, where, where, around the neck the neck, the neck, that's where. And it also indicates that the school colors was crimson and black. Hence the name of my presentation this evening. Another prominent educator at Jackson, Jefferson Elementary was the late Mr. Booker T. Booker T. Reeves Sr., 41 year teaching career. He had the rare uh, honor of being principal at Jackson Elementary School and also at Jefferson High School. He was the first black Charlottesville resident to graduate from the University of Virginia. Uh, this was in 1955. We had earned a degree, um, earned a degree in sociology. When, and he was one of four 2002 Charlottesville Bridge Builder honorees. Uh, he received a bachelor's degree from Hampton University. His visits home to his family while he was a Hampton student was reported on the social pages of The Reflector, which is Charlottesville's only black uh, newspaper at the time. Uh, Mr. Reeves has a lot of firsts in his career. I won't be able to go into all of them here. Uh, his thesis at UVA was a study of the prevalence of infant and maternal mortality in Virginia. Uh, in 1952, while he was still at UVA, he did a paper on race relations, and for some reason, four years later, it was consulted by Charlottesville City School officials who hoped to use it as a means to derail school desegregation efforts. Mr. Rees was also the first Black principal of the integrated Charlottesville School that was at McGuffrey, McGuffrey uh, Elementary. He was also a co-founder of the NAACP. Uh, chapter here in Charlottesville, a remarkable career, a remarkable man. I suppose many members of this audience have heard of Luther P. Jackson. He was a Virginia State college history professor and a pioneering civil rights activist. Uh, he was the first African-American scholar to lecture at the university at, at, UVA, at UVA in 1949 when he delivered a paper at a symposium in which he defended the NAACP's legal challenges against school desegregation. Um, another remarkable individual, uh, he dedicated his life to the research and writing of African-American history. He was widely respected as a historian and crusader for civic freedom. Uh, unfortunately, during his travels as a researcher uh, across Virginia, he always made sure that he wore a coat and tie. I mean, just for self-preservation, he always made sure he wore a coat and tie and that he carried a briefcase. He also made sure that he got out of town by sundown, wherever he was. Now, what is his connection with the Jefferson School and Charlottesville and all that? Um, well, his son, it turns out that his son, Edward Jackson, uh, was, a, was taught music and taught band, music, and choir at Charlottesville Elementary for a few years during the 1940s. I, unfortunately, I was unable to find a picture of, of Edward Jackson. But his father is certainly, certainly uh, highly, highly respected among the historical profession. At the University of Virginia, of course, there's the Office of African American Affairs is named after him, uh, the Luther P. Jackson House.
The Charlottesville newspaper, as I mentioned earlier, the Reflector, this is Charlottesville's second black newspaper. And we have issues, we have scattered issues in special collection. The newspaper, this newspaper included a column solely devoted to Jefferson High School. It's called Jefferson School Notes. It's over in the, it's on the second page, as you can see, I've had, I've got it outlined in, in red. Uh, it, rep it reported positive and regular publicity about the activities and successes of the Jefferson School, its faculty, students, and, and parents. Um, we, as I said, we have scattered issues of this newspaper. It is also apparently available online in a few places. Uh, Charlotte, by the way, Charlottesville's first black newspaper was the Charlottesville Messenger. That was published between 1909 and 1932, but only one, apparently only one issue has survived. And we do have that issue uh, at Special Collection. It's the August 1921 issue. Displayed on the left here on this slide is the first issue, front page of the Jeffersonia. Uh, it's a little hard to read, so I've, I've taken it from the uh, text. It says, the Jeffersonian is written and edited by the pupils and supervised by the faculty of Jefferson High. This paper furnishes a natural means of unifying the purposes and statements of the school. This paper should be a means of stimulating school pride and school loyalty. The Jeffersonian was highly respected in, in, the, in the black community were very, and it was very proud of it. And throughout his existence, this newspaper carried paid advertisements from black and white owned uh, uh, businesses. But of special interest is the panorama column, which was actually a gossip column. And that's in the, uh, that's on the second, the page beside it on the second page, that's from the October 1945 issue. You will note that there is a, I've highlighted an area in red that's been censored. I have no idea why that was censored. That's the way the issue was. Apparently it was censored like that before the issues were distributed. Doesn't like someone just censored this one particular issue of their own particular copy of it, but I have not been able to, I've tried all kinds of trick with lighting and everything to try to find out what exactly was being censored in that section, but I have not yet been able to do so. On the upper right of this page, you see our line in blue, an advertisement for a lady by the name of Miss Otelia Love Jackson, Notary Public, Fire Insurance, 404 Common Street. I will talk more about Miss, Mrs. Jackson later on in the course of my uh, lecture, but she was a remarkable figure in her own right as well. Oh, by the way, the Jeffersonian also reported on the activities of the Jefferson uh, Elementary School grades one through seven. These are the Christmas editions of the Jeffersonian. Apparently the last day of class before Christmas break was on December 22nd in 1942 and 1943. You notice that these, these very colorful uh, illustrations on the front page of each one of these issues, Christmas tree on the left, the candles uh, represented in the nativity on the, on the right. Uh, wartime rationing of the co of color ink and newsprint during World War II forced reductions, not only of the Jeffersonian's page size and the number of these pages, but also these Christmas pages, like the, as you see here, were not able to be produced for the remainder of the war. So only for 1942 and 1943 were the students able to have these Christmas-like illustrations of the Jeffersonian. And these, of course, are some of the alumni I'm sure the audience will recognize. These are Jefferson High School yearbooks and went through different names over the years. The first one on the left, of course, is Cherished Thoughts. This was for 1941. It was only one volume published with that title. The middle issue is The Victor, 1942, also one item. Notice, if you, I don't know if you can see that because of the red, but notice the wartime patriotic motif 
of a teenage boy and girl carrying an American flag. The last image here, the crimson and black, of course, this is a 1943 issue. Three volumes were published under this title in 1943, 1944, and 1945. Uh, you would note the wartime patriotic motif of the Statue of Liberty as well. And these are held as special collections, by the way. So we have a total of six volumes regarding Jefferson High School yearbooks. A photograph of the uh, 1935 undefeated Crimson and Black Jefferson High School football team, also known as the Red Devils. Um, the, you won't be able to see it because it's, so, it's a little faint, but the gentleman, the young man in the center, number either 25 or 30, he's holding the football, showing this, the team's defeat of Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, 12 to 6. The home games of the Jefferson High School football, play, football team were played at UVA's Lambert Field. Thanks to uh, one of our just dearly beloved and respected local uh, uh, residents and alumnus of Jefferson School, Ms. Teresa Price, uh, she provided the information uh, of being able to identify the names of some of these players. I won't, I can't go into all their names right now, except that I will say that on the left is the team physician, um, Dr. Edward Stanton, and on the right is Mr. James Egger, who was the coach. But Ms. Ms. Teresa Price provided the, you know, the identifications for these. And this gentleman is Mr. Was Mr. Roosevelt Rosie Brown Jr., who was a had a spectacular football career in the NFL, exclusive with the New York uh, Giants, 13-year offensive tackle, first player from a black college to be enshrined into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, the NFL a few years back had his 100 greatest players of all time, and he was he's on that list as one of the great one of the as one of the greatest players of all time. Mr. Brown had an interesting start in life. He, uh, his brother, his older brother, one of his older brothers was hurt playing football. So his father actually forbade him from playing football at Jefferson School. So he went, he went out for the band, played the uh, trumpet among other things. But one day the high school coach saw him in the hallway somewhere and said, you're coming to, you're gonna play on the team. According to Mr. Brown's recollections, he thought the football coach and the music football coach and the band director were going to get in a fight over him because each one wanted him to play for, for them. And finally, the football coach clinched it by saying, well, no, no big black guy like you, you're not going to make a living playing the trumpet. you got a better shot being a football player. Um, Mr. Brown also recalled that when he, his, when he went to school, uh, he was tested. When he first went to school, he was tested. And at the end of the test, uh, he was skipped grades one through two and was Put in the third grade, and he later recalled that he wound up graduating from uh, from uh, from from uh, high school at age 15, and by age 19, he was playing pro football with the NFL. And there is a Roosevelt Brown Boulevard at Main Street dedicated to him, by the way. We have several examples of uh, graduation exercises for the Jefferson Elementary School and the Jefferson High School. So I just wanted to show these two examples, but we have uh, a great many more than, than, than these, obviously. Uh, I've always been curious on the right why Jefferson High School had to have their ceremony in First Baptist Church. From what I saw of First Baptist Church, it wasn't much 
bigger audience space than Jefferson High School, but there must have been a reason for them to do that. You would notice that Jefferson Elementary School, on the other hand, held their graduation exercises in, Jeff in the Jefferson High School auditorium. Now we turn to the Jefferson High activities of the Jefferson High School Band and Glee Club. The, slide, the, the image on the left is a PTA fundraiser for band uniform that was held in uh, 1940. Uh, the Hampton Institute Band came and performed for that. It was held at the, uh, this event was held at the New Armory. The event on the right is the Jefferson High School Band and Glee Club offering uh, a concert a um, series of programs on a very early Thursday morning concert uh, doing what was known as National Music Week. Uh, the fundraiser for the band uniform was supported by 30 local businesses and nearly 200 patrons, including school board members who were mostly white, of course, at that time, and prominent races, prominent residents of both races. And speaking of the Charlottesville High School Parent Teacher Association, the lady on the right, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ms. Otelia Love Jackson was its president. Her husband, Dr. John Andrew Jackson, was one of the signatories of the petition for, uh, for a colored high school in Charlottesville. Uh, he was also Charlottesville's first black dentist. And for 50 years, they were, a, they were one of the power couples in Charlottesville, uh, members of the so-called 400 Club. Mrs. Mrs. Jackson was also, as far as I can tell, she was the first black notary, notary public in Charlottesville. And she ran advertisements in the Jeffersonian and the Reflector advertising her services as a black notary uh, public. This Charlottesville couple uh, engaged in a variety of charitable, civic, educational, and fraternal, professional, and religious activities their activities were regularly reported in the social columns of the city's black newspapers. Um, Dr. Jackson also delivered weekly dental hygiene lectures at Jackson's uh, elementary. As I said, he was the city's first black dentist. Uh, Mrs. Jackson was also the city's first black female insurance agent. Two of their seven children became dentists like uh, their father. Um, Mrs. Jackson was involved in a variety of other social uh, events. I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into all her social events. She was affiliated with the First Baptist Church. Um, uh, I think she was the clerk there. Um, her, her husband, she and her husband, coincidentally, she and her husband died exactly 10 years apart in April. He died in April, 1956, and she died in April, 1966. And they are buried together in Oakwood Cemetery. Now this item is uh, something that you use that you don't usually see in a presentation like this. This is from our Charlottesville City School Collection, and it contains school census material separated into white and uh, black, of course, regarding uh, the parents, the child's school attendance, literacy level, et cetera. So this is a 1940 record of a typical black Charlottesville family. Now, I must make an explanation here. I've concealed the names of the family and their street address. Although technically under the law, I'm not required to do so. They're all deceased. I've checked into that. They're all deceased. There's nothing shameful about their past or anything like that. But um, I decided after consulting with my wife, I decided to um, um, delete their, their names. Uh, one of the children in this record was, a Jeff was of course, a Jefferson, was a Jefferson High School graduate. Graduate, he was a member of the Jeffersonian editorial staff, a World War II veteran, and passed away early in the early part of this century. But there are there are literally thousands of these cards for 
uh, students here in Charlottesville. The father was a plasterer, the, 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 his wife was a housewife, and they had four children, all sons, and they all attended Jefferson. You would notice on the upper right-hand side, you was, upper right-hand corner, you would see that it indicates that they are, that the nearest school to them is the Jefferson School, where there were no other black schools in Charlottesville at the time, so there was nothing else for them to choose from. Uh, the forms indicate things like uh, whether the whether people are able to read or write, whether they had any uh, handicapped physical handicaps such as in hearing, vision, speech, or crippled defect or mental deficiency, anything like that. As I said, there are thousands of these. We have card. We have census. Uh, in, in the collection for this, this, this particular collection, this is the Charlottesville City School Collection. We have Virginia census for 1920 and 1930 as well. So it's literally thousands of cards. And some members of the audience may recognize these institutions. At the top left is uh, the Charlottesville Albemarle Training School, which was founded in the late 1890s. It was Charlottesville County's first African-American secondary school. Its curriculum was fashioned after Booker T. Washington's philosophy of a combination of basic elementary education and two years of vocational uh, training. At the top right is the fourth issue or what was known as the Esmont High School Journal. This was an Esmont High School. Uh, Yancey Elementary eventually opened on the site of the former Esmont School in 1960. At the bottom left is the Jefferson High School yearbook, which we have seen previously cherished thoughts. And at the bottom right, graduation exercises of Jackson P. Burley High School for 1953. Uh, it was open in uh, 1950 to educate African American students. Uh, the school was a result of a vote to consolidate Esmont High School, Charlottesville High School, and the Albemarle uh, um, um, Training School. And this is a 1950s area view of Vinegar Hill showing the Jefferson Greatest School. Uh, that highlight is original to the picture. I didn't do that. That, that was, that's on the picture. Uh, you can also see the Jefferson High School. And basically what we're looking at is a lost uh, landscape, a lost community, a lost world. This is, this is showing Vinegar Hill. And with the exception of the Jefferson schools and a few other structures, all of these other structures are gone now because of so-called urban uh, redevelopment. Uh, which victimized uh, Vinegar Hill. This is an example of uh, separate but equal tax dollars that work to prevent school desegregation. The top caption says, work now underway at Jefferson School, looking toward the rear of Jefferson Elementary School left and old Jefferson School right, where the site is being excavated for the construction of a gymnasium and 12 classroom. The old Jefferson School building is now known as Carver Recreation Center. Shown in the background is the city's gas department. Gas storage tank will be removed. The bottom you know, illustration says the site of Jefferson School Gymnasium and 12 classrooms, area bounded by Brown, 4th, 5th Streets, and Shanks Branch, now being excavated for the enlargement of Jefferson Elementary School for Negroes. And I suppose for some members of the audience who are the same generation as I, being born in the 1950s, who attended segregation, segregated schools, uh, certainly where I lived, uh, the, the city fathers started all of a sudden building all these new schools uh, in Black communities, the idea being to defer uh, desegregation uh, didn't quite work. 
Uh, but they all of a sudden we got these spanking brand new uh, schools and housing development and things of that nature. It needs to be said that some parents, or some black parents were leery about desegregation. Um, there's nothing wrong with wanting to protect your child, but they, some parents were, were, were leery about this. Uh, as I've indicated here in the caption, Jefferson was the, the school of choice among, um, remained the school of choice among black parents as late as 1961. Uh, of 44 uh, students, black students living outside the Jefferson School District, 32% uh, of their parents wanted them to, to go to Jefferson under what was called the Voluntary Pupil Assignment Program. This is a program that the state of Virginia uh, came up with to try, again, to try to defer uh, desegregation by supposedly offering parents a choice, letting parents theoretically make a choice about what school their child would go to. So as I said, 73% of the parents that were eligible preferred that their children continue to go to uh, Jefferson Elementary. Now I turn to some public sources. Hopefully they're readily available at your local library uh, if you want to take a look at them. Uh, these two published sources on Alfamar County history, um, Alfamar County, Charlottesville, African American, the Jefferson School. Um, the book on the left is by the Agnes Cross White, the Charlottesville African American Unit. This is basically a photographic uh, history of Black Charlottesville. Uh, Agnes, I call her Agnes because we were friends. Agnes was the uh, conservative Republican publisher and editor of the Tribune. Charlottesville Tribune until it ceased publication in 2011. She inherited it in 1991 from its founder, Randolph Lewis White, who was her former father-in-law. She was the ex-wife of his son, Sherman White, who passed away just a few years ago. Uh, the Tribune was founded in 1954 by Randolph White as the Charlottesville Tribune, later became the Charlottesville Avermaugh Tribune, and it was published in Roanoke under the auspices of its sister newspaper, the Roanoke uh, Tribune. It was renamed the Tribune by Agnes White in 1992. And we hold scattered issues of the, of the Tribune, by the way. The book on the right is probably more, most, some of you are more aware of this. This is Bridge Builders, 2001-2016, uh, Charlottesville. It was edit, uh, edited by Kay Slaughter, uh, first woman mayor of Charlottesville. And it, it notes 32, 36 residents who were honored as unsung heroes and bridge builders. So as you can see by the cover and the back of it, the back cover is, is reflective of the same. This is not just an African-American thing. This is, this is the Charlottesville community, people who work to make this a better community and especially in regards to race relations. So 36 uh, residents are honored in, in that book and their, their, bio, their biographies of these individuals along with their photographs. In this in this this rather handsome book, something that may not as be not as readily available, but we hold it in special collections. This is, of course, the uh, final report on the uh, final report to Charlottesville City Council with recommendation by with recommendations of the Jefferson School Task Force. Their goal was, quote, bringing back to life historic Jefferson School. And this is a fairly comprehensive report and certainly the culmination of a lot of work uh, by a lot of good folk in Charlottesville. And we do have this copy of this report is held in special collections in the, uh, in the Nancy K. O'Brien papers, by the way. Now this, this book is one of my favorite books, not because many of my friends were affiliated, but this is of course, Pride Overcomes Prejudice, The History of Charlottesville African-American School, uh, done by my good friend, Andrea Douglas, who runs things at the uh, uh, Jefferson Center. Um, one reason why I like this book is strictly as a scholar, because it's footnoted. 
So it, it does document its sources. It has an outstanding bibliography as well. And it's a book that I recommend regularly to people who are trying to do research on aspects of African-American history. It begins with the 1860s. It doesn't go into the slavery period for in any great detail, but it's very good overview for the 19, 1860s and 1960s. Uh, Andrea Douglas was the editor, Dr. Andrea Douglas is the editor, and it includes essays by her and uh, other individuals such as Scott French, who was the University of Central Florida, the late Paul Gaston, who was of the University of Virginia, uh, Lauren Etten Lee, who at that time was employed at the Virginia Historical Society, and another good friend of mine, Patrice Gr Preston Grimes, who just recently retired from the University of Virginia. Uh, this book is certainly extremely, uh, extremely useful. I can, I highly recommend it. So to conclude, I'm just gonna read what I've written here because I might stumble otherwise. In the 21st century, the Jefferson School Center is a leading example in the commemoration of African-American historical sites and their repurposing as venues for community events. And it is today, to this day, and hopefully uh, will continue to be a very important and useful uh, aspect of the community. And now I actually will conclude with uh, with uh, my late parents. I, I trust the audience will allow me to indulge as a as a son of my late parents, Carrie and Irvin uh, Jordan uh, Senior. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning them here is not just because they're my parents, and I and I miss them terribly. They've been gone over ten years now. I, I really I terribly miss them. But because in the age of segregation, they encouraged me and my brother and sister to get an education. They saw education as the key. Uh, we grew up in an inner city uh, housing project, project. Uh, but my parents strongly believe in education and encouraged their children to get as much education as we could. So one reason why I'm here today doing this kind of work and sharing this information with you is because my parents talked me out of making what I would possibly would have been the dumbest decision of my life. In my second year of high school, I was so frustrated with school that I decided to drop out of school. And I was gonna drop out of high school. Well, mom and dad were not having any of that. And if it wasn't for them, I don't know what would happen to me. I certainly might not even gone on to college, but um, I passed this on to parents. My, my, my parents basically said, if you're not in school in September, this fall in September, we expect you to be out here with a full-time job or join the army. So I decided to go on with school. But anyway, thank you very much for your kind attention. I will certainly try to answer any questions that I can, but I will also repeat that if I don't know the answer to a question, I will say so. Thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jordan. That was, uh, that was fabulous. Um, and definitely glad your parents uh, talked you into not dropping out of school as the, the father of a number of kids and stepfather to a number of kids. I, I definitely understand the situation of being a teenager. So um, uh, we can make stupid decisions as teenagers. But. Well, I see that there's a gentleman on the screen who could who also can attest to what I just said. My brother, Robert, who's in Fairfax, Virginia, he can certainly testify to everything that I've said. <laughs> Hi, yes, 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 I can. Uh, I'm the uh, I'm the uh, the baby brother of Professor Jordan. I'm the one that actually went in the military and did 23 years of retired. So I am a retired veteran. And the words of wisdom that our parents both gave me and my brother and my sister uh, were very helpful and very fruitful and everything. It gave us direction and it gave us purpose. Um, so I, I appreciate the fact that he does these lectures and speaking engagements and whatnot. And I, I try to go to all of them as I can, everything. So I could just smile and brush and say, that's my big brother. But, um, you know, we're all a proud of him and everything. And I'm sure mom and dad are, are proud of him as well, just like I am. And I'll always be his little brother, no matter how old I get, you know, I'll always be his little brother. But I have uh, two questions to ask, uh, you know, my big brother, you know, Irv, as I call him. Uh, one question is, uh, this, 
uh, on your presentation, you mentioned that the school had three districts uh, some time ago. Um, are those three districts still in existence or have they merged or have they dissipated or what? What, what, what came about those, those school districts? Those school That's districts are defunct now. There isn't a Jefferson Elementary District anymore because of desegregation. Okay. Segregation uh, into that. Okay, and my last question is, because I don't want to hog all this on and everything. Uh, you mentioned the Jefferson School uh, Project Report. Uh, what was the result of that, of that of that project report and is this, is this still in existence today? One of the things the project report uh, helped to produce was the Jefferson, what is called the Jefferson School Center now. Uh, it's an African-American heritage center and it's a very thriving institution and occasionally I've had some affiliation with it. Okay. Thanks a lot, Er, bro. <laughs> You're very welcome, Robert. Sterling, you see any questions? I think I had, um, let's see. I've got a couple here. Uh, okay. Eric Wilson would love to hear more about the uh, sponsors on the ad page that you had showed. The sponsors on the ad page. I've been intrigued by those. As I said, many of those were, uh, many of those were uh, not just black, uh, sponsors, but they were white sponsors. I'm trying to bring up the exact slides so I can refer to that on the notes. I'm, I got another computer working here, so just bear with me. Yeah, the, the, the sponsors for the Jeff, you know, I'm, I've always been intrigued by that, that these high school students, these black high school students in the 1930s and 40s were able to convince local white businesses, not just black businesses, that was a given, but local white businesses to support them as well. Um, one reason for that may be that or white businesses given that this was during the depression, recognized that uh, no one questions the color of a dollar. So if a black person comes to the store to make a purchase, uh, no one's gonna question the color of his money. So that's the only reason I can think of, but I've always been intrigued by that. And uh, you know, they, they were self-supporting and uh, because they were able to get these, these local businesses to, uh, um, to support them. I wish I could have made the screen a little bit larger, but, but if you remember the slide is Pepsi Cola, is Kel and some of these businesses still here today, like Keller and George for example, are still in business here today. And uh, so I've always been fascinated by that. That's a, that's a positive thing to see in, in the history of this area. Um, another question, uh, Rosalind Miller asks, are those school census cards in a database anywhere? They are not. They are not. The, they are the original cards. They are yellow. Uh, some of them are the, the deteriorating. Um, they're still in the original, uh, those old style uh, black and white modeled uh, storage index boxes, except these cars are like maybe, uh, they might be five by six, if my memory's correct, four by five or something like that. They're fairly large cars. They're about the size of a good size paperback book. Uh, so they're in extremely fragile condition in, in many ways. No work has been done on it. Is, I'm not exaggerating. There are thousands of them. And it's not just for blacks, it's for blacks and whites. Uh, so they're there, they're available for research. That's the good thing. They are available for research. Um, uh, they, unfortunately, because of this pandemic, let me, this gives me a chance to say something. Unfortunately, because of this pandemic, pandemic the Small Special Collections Library is not allowing access uh, by researchers to, to the building physically with the exception of people who are UVA, current UVA ID holders. Uh, we're not allowing outside people in at this moment because of the, I'm sure the, the audience will appreciate this. Now we may resume, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to resume um, people being able to come in and do in-house research in the fall, but no decision has been made on that as far as I know. But those uh, those cards, that, that, that Virginia census, and that's part of the Charlottesville School Board records that we hold here. Those are under normal circumstances, they are available for research, but there's no index. I literally would spend my lunch hour uh, sitting on the floor with these, with these boxes of cards and just going through one card at a time, trying to find something interesting that might be of interest to this audience for this particular slide thing. Because originally this whole presentation was supposed to have been done last year, it would have been you know, in person. Uh, it would have been done this time last year, but of course the, the coronavirus came in in March so uh, I, I got to do it this way, hopefully reach more people. But 
Uh, there are thousands of these cards and they're just waiting for people to come in and, and you can just do all kinds of research, all kinds of urban and demographic and sociological research with them. Um, Lucille Smith asks, is there a consolidated listing of all the Jefferson School teachers from 1865 to 1951? Rem Coincidentally, I was asked that question as a reference letter a couple of months ago. While, even though I'm working from home, uh, the, the, the special collections will forward reference letters to me to try to answer if I can uh, from home. There is no consolidated list that I know of. However, I say this with a caveat. I have not gone through the Charlottesville School Board uh, papers in any great detail. Uh, I have not seen anything in the folder headings that I've looked at that say this is a full list of all the Black instructors. So this person has asked a question that someone else has already asked me. And at this time, I would have to say that I do not, I do not know of any such listing in the, in the collection of the papers. Um, the Charlottesville School Board still holds records. It, conceivably, there might be something there, but uh, it depends on if they would allow uh, public uh, access to those records. So at this point, I really, I don't believe there is a list, but I could be wrong, but we won't know until someone actually goes through these records in great detail. And this is a huge, uh, this, our Charlottesville School Board record is just huge. It's, 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 it's a huge, huge collection. We have a finding aid to it, but nothing in the finding aid says something like, list of all black teachers no there may be a listing of black teachers at a certain points in time by decade or by a specific year but overall from like the 1890s to whatever i don't believe there is such a listing at this point in time well, i believe that's all that has come in unless there's someone else out there who has a question hey sterling it's carolyn rainey thank you my question is, is more of a statement. <clears throat> I happen to serve on the board for the Jefferson School Foundation, and we are planning a rededication in October. That's a community event. And Professor Jordan, I'd really like to talk to you about this presentation and potentially other items or um, information that you might have that we could include or incorporate into that rededication event that we're planning. Thank you. I would, I would welcome um, I'll welcome the opportunity to provide you uh, with information. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm assuming that my that the special collections library will be reopened to the public then. I'm assuming that. I know that UVA is gearing up to resume fall classes. So because of that, I'm assuming that we're going to be open to the public again uh, as well. Um, so I will do what I can when I can. I, I will add another caveat is that uh, for the rest of the year, I intend to continue wearing masks. That's the first thing. Secondly, I'm still in the process of trying to get uh, uh, vaccinated uh, for the virus. Uh, but whatever I can do, if I can steer you to a specific collection, <laughs> in some cases, in some of my notes, I even can tell you what folder, what box to go to. If, I can, if there's information that I can pass on to you in that regard, um, I will do so. Um, it's it's difficult. It's it's a little it's a little frustrating doing this kind of providing that kind of information to you by email or even over the phone. It's something like that that I would prefer that someone would actually come into make an appointment, come into special collections, and we can get on our, our our public terminals, and I can walk you through things, something like that. But it's it's still early on the game, so maybe something can be worked out later on. But I would be glad to assist in any way that I can. I, I will say that. I just don't know what the exact format that will be, but I will certainly provide whatever assistance. Great. I appreciate it. And I'll get to Sterling to get information on how to connect with you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Ms. Rainey. Um, I also saw that uh, Ms. Sue Friedman was in the audience, also the executive director for the Jefferson School Foundation. So we're uh, historical Society is looking forward to, to working with you all about the, the rededication in October. Um, my, I have one question. The rededication is of the foundation. So that would be the, the actual building foundation for the, the frame structure that was in some of those photos. Um, is that correct? 
Yeah, and Sue, why don't you, Sue, I don't know if you're on to able to speak or, but yes. <laughs> okay. That, and it's also celebrating, you know, the importance of the school in our community, the impact of the teachers that were there. It's really looking at, you know, the history of the school and what we see it being as it goes forward. You know, it's the history and, and where we're headed with it within the community. So it's, it's very broad based. Well, this is gonna sound self-serving and maybe like I'm trying to cheat or something like that, but maybe I could do an encore presentation of this particular presentation. And that was all, all, all both our problems in a way. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I sent a text to Sue and said, maybe there's a way we can incorporate this into our event during the day to have this as part of the day's event. So I love how you think you're on the right path. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm glad this uh, little uh, focus on local history can also bring together partnerships. So this is great. And Tom, please call me Carolyn. You do not need to call me Ms. Rainey. So thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, there's something else I also neglected to go at the beginning. I neglected to thank uh, my fellow members of the uh, uh, Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society Board of Directors for uh, allowing me to do this presentation. As I said, it was originally scheduled for last year and we got put on hold. So I, I greatly appreciate uh, them, particularly uh, uh, President Shelley Murphy for, you know, for allowing me to do this, this uh, presentation. In the course of my career, I've got, I've got a couple, not a lot, but I've got a few PowerPoints that never got delivered for a variety of reasons of weather or whatever. And so I thought this would be one of them. Fortunately, I kept working on this, being curious about Jefferson School history. So when I was given the opportunity to, to present it this year, I, I certainly jumped at the chance. I do want to take this opportunity of thanking my colleagues on the, uh, on the uh, Avamar County Historical Society Board of Directors for allowing me to do this. Well, we appreciate it, uh, Professor Jordan. Thank you very much. I did one more question on my part, and then I'll let us all go here. But you mentioned the uh, petition to the city school board in 1921 for the Colored High School. Um, I was curious if you thought that might have any connection to the fact that the Charlottesville Public Library was opening in 1921. I know it was in construction between 1919 to 1921, so I didn't know if there might have been some type of movement in Charlottesville at the time in terms of education, knowledge, and, and that was where the, the colored high school was, idea was coming from. I think you've hit on an interesting point. Or well, let me begin by saying, I didn't know about the, Charlotte, about the Charlottesville Public Library. However, I do know that there was not a black public library in Charlottesville during the 1920s. So one of the things that made this school so important was that it had a library. And as I've said before, it had over 800 volumes in it. Because Blacks, I know for a fact that Blacks were not allowed to use the library at the University of Virginia during this period, which was still uh, um, uh, largely at the Rotunda until Alderman Library was built in the 1930s. So I think there is a connection. I think the Black community, as you've indicated, as you suggested, may have said, let's strike while the iron's hot. You know, they're, they're building a public library we know we're not going to have access to it. If we can get a high school, what are the main thing? One of the things that high schools should have? They need to have gymnasiums, maybe a cafeteria, and definitely a library. Well, I know that's definitely from our, our research into the, the 100 years of this library history that I believe it was uh, publicly funded in starting in 1934, and I think it went through 1948. And Sterling's the expert on that, so he can correct that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and it was in the Jefferson School, you had a picture there, I believe, from 1945 from the, yes. showed the library. And mm -hmm. 1948, it was uh, officially defunded. Um, and then that was the unofficial date in which um, the public library in Charlottesville was uh, integrated, but mm -hmm. not necessarily in fact. Um, mm -hmm. It was something along the lines of how many membership cards that people used for the Jefferson School Library and how many of those transferred to the public library. It was like a, a half a percent of those in terms of 
the fact that they accepted them. Um, and it was definitely a, an indication of, you know, separate but unequal in the sense that Paul McIntyre would provide, you know, the full works of Shakespeare to the Charlottesville Public Library and then give the uh, Jefferson School Library 20 bucks. So it was not um, not equal in that regard. So if there's I don't no know. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, I don't know the condition. I'm, it, it certainly looks like a handsome library from the photograph. But I do know if you look at pictures of, lib of Black libraries, uh, particularly in the South during the 20s and 30s and 40s, a lot of these places are poorly heated. The, the students, the people are sitting in there wearing their coats, their overcoats and hats, because there's poor heating in these places. And I've often wondered what, what, did, what was that doing to the books in these places, but still people would go there because they wanted that knowledge. They needed a reference source and the, and the school library was the way to go. I did see one more question pop up in Facebook from a Miss Trish Bell. Um, and she's asking about the naming of the school, um, wondering where that came from. The Jefferson School? I would I would have to say like everything like every other thing in this area is named after Thomas Jefferson. That's just, that's just the way it was. And also, but but this this is something else that needs to be thought about too. And this this happened to a lot of black schools, particularly in the South. You name it after someone like Thomas Jefferson, in the hope that at least look the local white power structure would give you a school a little bit of respect and a little bit of a more budget money come come budget time. You know, it's named after Jefferson, the great the great educator who founded the University of Virginia and that sort of thing. So there was a method in the madness. So uh, if it were left up to me and, uh, you know, I wouldn't change the name for anything in the world. I, the, the black community embraced that name. Uh, I'm not saying that they had a great love of Jefferson per se, but they certainly embraced that name. But yeah, you, you named the school after someone like Jefferson, a local hero. Uh, yeah, that means that, that helps keep the four walls and roof on the school. For the, in the long term, or if you need a new school, you always say we want to build a new Jefferson uh, uh, school. So yeah, you know things are things are rarely done without a purpose when it comes to things like this. It, it, there's always a purpose behind it. Well, I, <clears throat> I would imagine the the, the African American population embraced the ideals that Jefferson espoused, if not. Um, the man himself. So, mm -hmm. exactly. one more question coming in. Certainly. Uh, Phyllis Leffler asks Is it surprising to you that the football team got to play home games on Lambeth Field given uh, the attitude of UVA in the 1930s towards uh, the Black population? Yeah, Phyllis is another old friend. Well, I don't want to say old friend, but another friend. Um, this is something that occurred across the South. I'm not surprised that they did it here in Charlottesville because my understanding was, was that the Jefferson High School team and later the Burley High School football team was very popular among whites. That there were a substantial number of whites who attended uh, uh, these games. Also, there's also the possibility that by allowing the team to play there, that meant that the city of Charlottesville was let off the hook of building them a football stadium by, by convincing the folks at UVA to allow them to play at Lambeth Field. Uh, let's remember that during this period of 20s and 30s, UVA football was not exactly, uh, they were not exactly a powerhouse team. So, <laughs> uh, so the stadium sitting there, why, why not put it to good use? But, but it also, based on what I've seen in my research, uh, uh, local whites attended these games too. So wow. you take, you can get, you get a school named after, you name the school after Jefferson, you get the school. You want to play football, uh, and UVA is not using the field, they get to use the field. And like I said, nothing, few things like this are done without purpose behind them. Or careful, cunning calculation, I will say. Cunning calculation. And I make a, la a lasting comment, if I may. Um, the football team, uh, back in the 30s of Jefferson High, uh, they nicknamed themselves the Red Devils. Uh, there's some correlation with that name Red Devils because it was also applied to World War II Army veterans, Tuskegee Airmen, who also named themselves the Red Devils. Hmm. So maybe that football team knew something, you know, 10 years prior to them winning the, the championship and everything that gave them that name of Red Devils. But I thought that was, I thought that was quite, you know, quite, you know, quite a, uh, a token in itself. 
Yeah, Robert, you always bring the military into, <laughs> into our conversation. We're all, the family's always been proud of your military service, but I think you got a point there. Uh, maybe they knew something that we didn't, we didn't, that we don't know. So uh, I, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. just getting to hear me and you talk back and forth, but you know, we live in two different cities. My, my brother and I have not actually laid eyes on each other during the course of this pandemic. It's been over a year since I've actually seen him in person. So I'm very much looking forward to this, this whole thing getting behind all of us. So I, I am fully vaccinated now, so. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope to be soon, hope to be soon. But uh, I, I very much enjoy doing this, uh, this, this, uh, this presentation because Charlottesville is my adopted home. I've lived here now most of my life. I, I came here in the fall of 1979. Um, my first job out of graduate school, uh, met a local lady, fell in love, got married, got a mortgage, got car payments, et cetera, et cetera. So Charlottesville is, is my home now. Um, and so I welcome opportunities to share uh, my expertise or my, my working knowledge of this aspect of Charlottesville history. Nobody knows all of Charlottesville's history, black or white. I certainly don't, I certainly never will, but I've certainly come to appreciate it. And there's just so many aspects of it that we don't know, but our, and I, there's so many aspects of it that we do know that are just totally, totally uh, fascinating. I come from a huge city. I come from Norfolk, Virginia, it's a huge city. So when I first came to Charlottesville, I was in culture shock. I said, what am I gonna do here? How am I gonna, <laughs> what's in it for me here? And 40 years later, yeah, as a historian, I can say there's a lot here for me. I've, I've learned so much and there's so much more I want to learn. And I'm glad to be able to share this information with my fellow citizens. We definitely appreciate it, uh, Professor Gordon. And, and along those same lines, we're, we're gonna be starting up a project here very soon, um, or we're in the beginning stages of it. And I was very interested when you brought up the sports and the football teams, um, because we're calling it uh, at this point, uh, sports and race. And it's a study of uh, the integration of athletics in Charlottesville and Albemarle County um, period uh, from Brown uh, versus Board of Education through generally the 19, early 1970s and in integration at UVA. So uh, a lot of those questions that we don't know and, and that we try to find that information, maybe we figure out the Red Devils question there. And uh, a lot of other questions about, you know, Burley and, and uh, Jefferson and uh, uh, how they were viewed and looked at from a segregated society and how through integration, you know, there were some pluses and minuses maybe in terms of how there's a complexity to that where sports and in the communities that surrounded those sports teams were broken apart and maybe never fully consolidated again until much, much later um, after integration. So we're hoping to maybe uh, utilize your resources, your historical skills to help us with that project. and. Uh, down the line, we'll definitely have a program on that. So again, we're, we're getting up close to 8.30 almost. So got to leave all these folks, let them go and uh, enjoy the rest of their evening. I want to thank you again, uh, Professor Jordan. This has been fabulous. I uh, want to rem have everyone remember that, you know, this is your historical society. So uh, if you found something you enjoyed tonight, hopefully consider um, joining us, becoming a member, uh, providing us a donation. Um, our speaker series is brought to you by the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society and, and wonderful supporters like you. So thanks again for Zooming with us today. Thanks to everyone out there for joining. Uh, my name is Tom Chapman with Sterling Howe, Professor Jordan, and we hope to see you for the next speaker series in June. And uh, till then, stay safe and support local history. Uh, Tom and Sterling, thank you for your technical uh, support and expertise in, in pulling this off. Uh, you know, with Zoom, you never know. <laughs> so uh, when it, it's great when it works, <laughs> and, and it worked. Thank you. Worked great and appreciated, and I uh, look forward to seeing you soon in person when we can. Okay. Will this be on YouTube? Yes. Uh, yes, we've had this recorded. So uh, immediately after, uh, you know, we end here, you can find it on Facebook Live. Um, mm -hmm. We'll be transferring it over to YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a great night. Take, Take care, care, Robert. Robert. Take Bye. care, Robert.